Christ, that event when the disciples experienced the presence of God and the transfigured beauty of Jesus of Nazareth. It was an event steeped in prayer. It was literally a mountaintop experience. And it was an event that left the disciples not knowing what to say. The church has observed and celebrated this event on August the 6th for centuries. There is, however, another event that is remembered on August the 6th. You might say it too was a transfiguration of sorts. Not steeped in prayer, nor would anyone describe it as a mountaintop experience. It did, however, leave its participants speechless. Now, students of the Bible often like to uh, lay similar, uh, different accounts of similar stories side by side, especially when it comes to the gospel readings. Uh, to take, for instance, a parable from the gospel according to Matthew of Jesus, and take the same parable uh, from the gospel according to Luke, and lay them side by side to gain deeper understandings, to let them be in conversation with each other, see what, what's similar, um, what's completely different, and what might those differences and similarities mean. So this morning, I would like to do a similar exercise, not with the same story, but I'd like to lay the two stories of these two events that are commemorated on this day, side by side. The transfiguration of our Lord accomplished by God, and the transfiguration of our planet and human experience uh, that was carried out by humans on August the 6th, 1945 when the first atomic bomb was dropped. So I w both of these stories are uh, replete with vivid imagery. So you might want to close your eyes, but at any rate, I'd like to invite you to sort of keep, keep your mind uh, versatile, to go back from one side to the other as I alternate in telling these stories. And let the images speak to you and, um, and just follow back and forth. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. The sounding of the all clear signal in Hiroshima at 7.31 a.m. on August 6th made little change in the tempo of the city. Most people had been too busy or too lazy to pay much attention to the alert. At 8.15, the few people in Hiroshima who caught sight of a new small formation of planes noticed that three parachutes blossomed from one of them. Seeing the parachutes, some people cheered, thinking the enemy planes were in trouble. And as Jesus was praying, the appearance of his countenance was altered, and his raiment became dazzling white. Behold, two men talked with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was to accomplish at Jerusalem. For three quarters of a minute, there was nothing but the parachutes in the sky over the city. Then suddenly, without a sound, there was no sky left over Hiroshima. For those who survived to recall it, the first instant of the atomic explosion was pure light, blinding, intense, but of awesome beauty and variety. One witness described a flash that turned from white to pink and then to blue as it rose and blossomed. Others seemed to see five or six bright colors. Some saw merely flashes of gold and a white light that reminded them, this was perhaps the most common description, of a huge photographic flashbulb exploding over the city. The sole impression was visual. If there was sound, no one heard it. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep but kept awake, and they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Thousands did not see anything at all. 
They were simply incinerated where they stood by the radiant heat that turned central Hiroshima into a gigantic oven. Thousands of others survived perhaps a second or two only to be shredded by the scattered window glass that flew before the blast waves or crushed underneath walls, beams, bricks, or other solid objects. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Several factors combined to produce more devastation than the nuclear experts had predicted. First, the precision of the drop. Then the time of the explosion in the early morning. Oppenheimer had assumed that most people would be in air raid shelters and had estimated 20,000 casualties. But there had been no specific alert, and most people were on their way to work. Thus, there were more than 70,000 casualties. As Peter said this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A few minutes after the explosion, a strange rain began to fall. The raindrops were as big as marbles and they were black. This frightening phenomenon resulted from the vaporization of moisture in the fireball and condensation in the cloud that spouted up from it. There was not enough of this black rain to put out the fires, but enough to heighten the panic. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my child, my chosen. Listen to him. Conflicting emotions jostled the minds of the airmen over the ruined city. Some were elated that the bomb had worked and hoped it would end the war. Some were torn between pride and dismay. Some simply could not relate what they saw to reality. Captain Robert A. Lewis, Tibbetts' co-pilot, was one of the first to speak. My God, he said, what have we done? And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. I weave these two stories together not to contrast the holiness of God with the sinfulness of humanity, although that's easily done in many ways, but rather to remind us that in both occasions, the glory of God was present. And in both occasions, when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. You know, there's another Sunday in the church year, where uh, this gospel reading of the Transfiguration is always proclaimed. Well, not another Sunday, because we just happen to have August 6th fall on the Sunday this year. But there is one Sunday every year we hear it. Does anybody know when that is? Christ the King. Huh? Christ the King. No, not Christ the King. Last it's Sunday before, last Sunday before Lent. Right. The last Sunday after Epiphany. Just as we're going into Lent to focus our attention on uh, Christ's suffering and death, this gospel serves as a reminder uh, of the presence of God's glory. In other words, uh, God's glory was ever as present while Jesus hung on the cross at Golgotha as it was on the Mount of the Transfiguration. The same God who made the face of Moses to shine and who transfigured our Lord's countenance is the same God who died on the cross and who suffered in the streets of Hiroshima and who suffers with us. It's hard for us to see that glory with human eyes in the difficult times in our own sufferings, in our own losses, but it's there. That's why we hear that story, to remind us that it is there, even in our sufferings, as 
traumatic as we can imagine. This is the God of life who always emerges from the clouds of our destruction to point to love incarnate and say, this is my chosen. This is my child. Listen to him. Amen.